All right. And so I would like to welcome Tara Scott. Uh, she's currently with Industrial Logic. Uh, she and I are, I should say, I've had the pleasure of working with Tara now. Um, oh, I worked with her on and off for about three months earlier this year. And it was a joy to work with her. Um, she's, she has wonderful insights and kept me in check in some, some ways. And I helped keep her in check in some ways. It was a wonderful dynamic dealing with some very complicated and interesting clients, I should say, <laughs> uh, that, that we're still sort of dealing with. And um, since then, I've actually had uh, the opportunity to attend uh, with her and with, um, with some others, the psychological safety workshop that Industrial Logic offers. And seeing her work her magic with those groups was, was insightful and very powerful. The, the message that comes from and the learning that comes from within that, and we talked about this just a little bit, is deep. And there's a lot of growth that can happen, a lot of great stuff that can happen. And it's all the amount that you put into it. I've seen some people that attend that just put a little bit into it and they, they get quite a bit out, but I've also seen other people just transform with it and in and around the idea of psycho psychological safety. And, you know, so for that, I'm, I'll go ahead and hand this off to Tara to talk about you do you, your best stuff in a psychologically safe environment. Hi, folks. Uh, it's really nice to meet all of you. Steve, thanks for the super kind words. Um, Steve is obviously awesome and wonderful to work with as well. Um, yeah, so I'm Tara. Uh, I work at Industrial Logic. I've been in the tech space for about a decade now. Um, I actually started my career um, in healthcare after being a English major who did graphic design. So I've kind of been like all over the place, um, but tech was the thing that stuck. Um, I'm going to dig into some stuff on psych safety today. It is definitely my jam. Um, like Steve was saying, it's something that um, I care deeply about. And so we're going to dig into that. I'm going to share a link in the meeting chat. And so if you want to click that, I won't be sharing my screen um, because there's going to be some interactive stuff we will do in uh, Google Slides. If for some reason you don't have access to um, a computer right now because you're jumping all over the place, that's cool too. Um, I'm also going to welcome you to just speak up when you want to speak, um, and we should be good. So I'm going to give folks a minute to populate, and if anybody has trouble with access, please let me know. I did make um, things visible for folks, but actually, now that I'm thinking of it, I'm going to make sure you're going to be able to edit things, too. Great. Okay. Pop myself there. All right, I see folks starting to hop in to frame one. Um, yeah, so really happy to be here. Also, I know people are from all over the world here, but I have to say Seattle is like one of my favorite places in America. It's super rad. I've been a few times and it never disappoints. Um, best sushi I've probably ever had and lots of other good stuff too. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about you do you, uh, your best stuff in psychologically safe environments. I'm going to dig into what psychological safety is, what it isn't, and so on. Uh, jump into frame two. Uh, like I said, I'm Tara. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an organizational coach. I'm also a product and UX coach and a fearless organization practitioner. You might be asking yourself, what the heck is that? Um, I was certified through Amy Edmondson's program. She's the person who really pioneered the term psychological safety to go into organizations and measure psychological safety on teams, because I really wanted to have data to kick off conversations for people who weren't ready to listen. So that's what I do. Um, a few things about me. I love running. Uh, I love cycling. I love bouldering, mostly indoor bouldering. I broke my wrist last spring. So this was not going to be the year that I started doing outdoor bouldering, but I'm hoping next year I can start to get into that. Um, 
animals, plants. I have so many plants. It's ridiculous. My partner and I have like, I don't know, 50, 60, too many. Um, and rock and roll. I used to actually write local music reviews. Um, used to sing, do a bunch of stuff. So that's a little bit about me, but in frame three, I would love to hear a little bit more about you. So feel free to grab a post-it, um, type your name, whatever your current role is and what you hope to get out of this. Um, I'm just gonna give folks a minute or two to do that. Yep. And sorry, when I mean posted, I just mean the little yellow squares. I'm so used to like now digital post-its. I just call them post-its. They're not, that's not real. They're zeros and ones, but also I can look at them and think post-it. It's not letting me enter anything. Really? I want to give a refresh. I had to refresh. Thank you. Um, I think it's oh, cached yes. in the browser. Yes. That's Are you good now? I love it. Yes. Software janitor. Oh, I have mixed feelings for you on that. <laughs> <laughs> In the custodial arts breakfast. Was that breakfast club? Yeah. Custodial okay. arts. All right, see folks are writing stuff. Thank you for writing this intro. Anyone wanna share um, the reason that, that they're here, something that you're wanting to dig into or something that, that you're curious about? I see folks who wanna create safer environments. That's awesome. Ways of dealing with the weirdness of the world, same. Still trying to do that every day. Oh, I love looking for be better cues and strategies for helping teams who aren't fully safe, yeah. Well, hopefully I will be able to provide you with some tools today that will allow you to dig into that stuff. I also noticed my little Sharpie pens down under here. What are you doing, buddy? Okay. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. There I think go. I saw it drag at one point. Uh, um, I, I sort of tagged along with someone else that talked about the, the cues and, and that sort of thing. Um, like for me, I, I've worked in places where I felt extremely comfortable and I, I guess label it psychologically safe to to say do you know what was the right thing or at least the right thing for me at the time etc yeah um, but but now I, I want that everywhere I work and it's, it's it's hard you know like how do I encourage that how do I because for me I had to learn that like there was, I wrote an email and I held my finger over the send button for a long time. Like I'm either going to get fired or it's going to be okay. And, and I sent it and it was okay. Right. And, and then I was like, Oh, Oh, I get it now. Right. That was a really defining moment, but how do I, how do I help other people see that it's okay to, you know, I, yeah. I, that's a very general way of putting it, but no, I love that page. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think we'll dabble on some of that stuff and it's, um, you're right in that every ecosystem you walk into, it kind of starts over because it's not this static thing. Um, and we'll dig into that. Um, it is always changing and ebbing and flowing comfort versus safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll dig into that too. 
I love that there's some ILers here who I haven't gotten to like interact with yet. Yeah, go ahead. Karen. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm from Seattle. Hi. Um, so what I'm dealing with is I was in a company where it was extremely psychologically safe. The customers loved us. They considered us gods. It was, you know, it was, it was one of those, one of those things that you never see. Right. Then we got sold to crazy people. Oh, and and they bought us in part because a bunch of Seattle techies, right? Right. Because they were they were off market and they needed they needed us. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, throwing people under the bus, lying to the yeah. CEO about some of us. Um, I find myself uh, scared to go out and get another position because I'm afraid that I'm going to end up in the same type of thing. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I am. Uh, I very much so relate to that. And it's once you have a traumatic experience with something like that, it sticks and yeah. it's something that continues to pop up. Thank you for sharing that though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. All right. Well, I'm ready to dig in with y'all. So let's um, jump to frame number four. So some of the things we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about why I care about this stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about what psychological safety is and what it isn't. I know that there were some comments made like Cody talking about comfort versus safety. I'm going to dig into a little bit of that. And then exactly what Karen's talking about, trauma response and scenarios. Like what happens when we do feel traumatized with something? Um, how does that show up for us and how do we take it with us? Um, and then showing up as you on your team, I kind of, um, I feel like we are one of the, uh, I don't want to say this too broadly, but we are an industry that is continuing to evolve in a good way when it comes to just being able to bring your best self. But that doesn't just mean physically, just because I get to have like blue hair and tattoos doesn't mean that I get to share every feeling that I have. That's a very different thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. And then we're going to talk about how you can actually measure psychological safety. So I'm going to jump into frame five, why this work matters to me. So I mentioned that I was in healthcare. So I was in healthcare for about a decade. Um, I actually worked in mental health. I did, I worked for a database research group. Um, and then I made the move to, uh, I, I was laid off from a hospital and ended up working. Uh, I was down the street from Dev Jam where David Hussman ran the show and I had no idea who he was and he hired me. It was just fate and luck and super great. And that was where I started my career in, um, in tech. And I am so grateful for that experience. Uh, but as I moved through my career in technology, as an engineer, as a coach, as an engineering manager, as a coach, I started noticing that there was so much expectation of like this whole quote unquote agile and like making sure we like move really quickly and adapt quickly, but it was always about the work and not the behavior. And I didn't understand like, okay, we keep throwing these people together and saying like, collaborate, everybody do your thing and show up as you. Not everyone's just going to do that. Um, behavior is just as agile and as adaptable as any project or deliverable, in my opinion. Um, you're going to see in this picture here, a couple of really cute pugs and myself and my dad. So my dad worked in um, technology too, but he was um, more in the sales side of things. He did hardware sales for, for IBM. And I watched stress eat this man alive. Um, he became kind of a, a, a shell of himself when he would just, I would watch his brain implode every morning, like sitting over the counter, eating donuts and just being so stressed out about the pressure of being able to perform. And in the eighties, when I was a kid, it wasn't a, um, it, um, Sherry, yes, to answer your question, I'm not going to be sharing my screen, but I'm going to have folks follow along in the Google slides because there will be things you will be interacting with. And I will just reshare that in case anybody missed it. Thank you for that question though. Um, but my dad um, had a psychotic break about 17 years ago and it wasn't solely because of work, but he told me after that happened, he said, you know, I would be told you don't sell, you don't eat, you don't perform, you don't eat. And I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell your mom. And I just basically imploded. And I started watching folks who I worked with who were starting to have symptoms that looked 
like that, just watching the stress just eat away at them. And I, I thought we need to have better conversations about this stuff. Um, so I really wanted to dedicate the work that I had done in technology to the behavior side instead. I was like, okay, yep, I, 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 I care deeply about this industry. I really want to be able to help folks how can I best do that? Um, since I did work in mental health, um, and I, I, I actually almost was a therapist, it was real close. Um, this was like a perfect segue for me to move from doing coaching um, on the product and UX side and technical side and moving into doing psychological safety work. Um, Cause I think that we really are, we're humans first. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever read the book Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, it's, it's basically a book about like, what happens if we do replace everyone with machines and what happens when we decide to not put humanity first? Um, totally agree, Anthony. I actually did a, an independent study in college on Kurt Vonnegut, nerd, book nerd here. Um, but there is, we do ourselves such a disservice when we don't recognize our own humanity and how much better we can perform when we actually show up as ourselves. So if you can meet me in frame number six, oh, I want to say one thing about in frame five. My dad's actually doing quite awesome these days. He has done a lot of work on himself, but a lot of that work has been self-reflection and self-awareness, which we're going to dig into. Frame number six. I like to show this statistic because I think it's actually a good one. 4.5 million Americans quit their jobs in November of 2021. People are no longer willing to show up in a place that does not treat them well. And they are no longer willing to sacrifice the life that they have for a paycheck. Now, I know that that is a privilege. Not everyone in every industry or in every segment of America is able to do this. But I really appreciate that people are putting, taking power and putting it into their own hands and doing this. Um, and a big reason for that is to build self-awareness. If In frame number seven, um, so this is, I'm not gonna read through all of this, but have folks here heard of Project Aristotle that Google did many moons ago? I think they should do another one because the data feels like older to me now. But um, Project Aristotle was uh, Google's way of saying like, what makes a high performing team effective? Uh, and the results were psychological safety, number one with a bullet. The rest of the stuff matters, but it won't matter as much and it won't be as impactful if we don't have psychological safety. Um, it was more about how do people perform when they actually show up as themselves and they don't feel like afraid to make a comment or afraid to speak up in front of their boss. And we're going to get into that here in a second. So frame eight, um, so psychological safety, what is it? So it was pioneered by Amy Edmondson, like I mentioned, uh, she is a professor of leadership and management at Harvard. Um, I'm obviously a total fangirl for her. She's amazing. Um, she actually started the project not even about, it wasn't about psychological safety at all. When she had started her thesis in 1998, it was about um, hospitals and errors. When do hospitals make the most errors? And what she discovered was the teams that uh, of nurses and um, medical practitioners who asked less questions made more mistakes because they were afraid to call a doctor who was not, not at the hospital, who um, was afraid of a dynamic with another colleague. If anybody's ever seen Scrubs, Dr. Cox, like I think that there is some reality to that, right? And so she watched these teams um, make horrible, like life-threatening mistakes because they were afraid to show up. And that's what really uh, forced her hand to say like, oh my gosh, how deep does this stuff go? She defines psychological safety as a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. So the thing that's most interesting to me about this is it is not so, it's, it can be both. So it's not solely about one individual, it's about the team. It's about the collective. One person cannot go in and say, yep, we're a psychologically safe team. It has to be something that is shared and felt amongst the team. And like I mentioned, when I started this, um, it's not static. This is a dynamic thing that continues to move ebb flow. Um, it's actually first felt in the nervous system. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, then in the mind and then the voice, but our physical bodies when we feel psychologically safe and when we feel unsafe, we're going to feel it here first, but we are moving so fast. A lot of times we don't take the time to think about 
where, where is the starting? Usually it's, it's, we're, we're moving a million miles an hour. And by the time it really impacts us, we're like, holy crap, how am I in this position? A few things that it isn't to echo what Cody had mentioned. Um, it's not about feeling comfy or protected as myself and my colleague, Ashley, like to state, uh, faux safety or fuzzy safety. Um, it's really nice to feel like cozy and supported and protected. Sometimes that can be a byproduct of it. But ultimately, you want to be able to challenge folks. You want to be able to both bring empathy and challenging someone at the same time. So you don't get to just be like an obnoxious jerk. If folks have heard of radical candor, I do a whole thing on it. I'm not going to talk much about it here. But radical candor is the practice of challenging directly and being empathetic. It doesn't mean that you don't be empathetic and you just blurt your opinions. It's about really being able to show up together for the greater good, not just of the team, but for yourself. So it's kind of an all encompassing thing. Um, it's not a permanent state. Like I mentioned, whenever I go into a gig um, with a team or executives and they say, yep, we're safe. I'm like, okay, that's not really a thing. That's like saying I'm happy. Like I'm happy right now. I might be pissed off in 10 minutes. Like it's, it's something that changes all the time. Um, and it's not the responsibility of one person. Like I said, it's, it's not just one, it's about the team. So it really has to be everyone that shows up together for this. I'm going to jump into frame nine. I am not going to read all of these statistics to you and you will have access to this slide long after our discussion. But um, this is some information that I've pulled from Harvard Business Review about what happens at organizations that have high trust um, 106% more energy at work. I mean, these things aren't a joke and it's really about how we can create a sustainable environment that we're actually excited to do things. That doesn't mean we never get tired. That doesn't mean that we never need to take breaks, but it does mean that there are going to be a lot of benefits here. Um, and then you're going to see our little modern agile pie from industrial logic and make safety a prerequisite is in the lower corner. Before I jump on to the next slide, I wanted to get through these kind of fast because I don't want to be just blurting at you for an hour, but do you have any questions before we move on? I will say, Reggie, thank you so much for commenting that. Many devs, including myself, are introverts by nature and we hesitate to speak up and engage in many cases. It's all good. If you do want to engage and you would rather type things in chat, I am all about that. Um, I am definitely an ambivert by nature. I can go both ways and absolutely honor and respect that. Not everyone communicates the same way. Totally got it. All right. And Anthony is not seeing the data or words. Is anyone else not seeing the data or words on that slide? I can see it. Okay. Might need to be a refresh. Sometimes Google Slides just get super wonky. Um, let's move to frame 10. Um, so any and all work starts with ourselves. Uh, I teach something called the Psychological Safety Workshop, like Steve mentioned, at Industrial Logic. And this is the very first piece of what we dig into. Before we can start any conversations with anything else, any and all work has to start with ourselves. Um, our self is in the middle of that little circle. Um, that means understanding our needs. That means understanding our triggers, akin to what Karen has said. Um, understanding, like, if I've experienced trauma in some way, where is that going to come out? If I've had a boss who was terrible, and, and I actually did have a boss who threw a phone against a wall. And let me tell you, the next time I worked with a boss who got really angry, I was terrified that something crazy was going to happen because of that. So we take it with us. Um, it's also about taking responsibility for ourselves. And that means the good and the bad stuff. And we're going to dig into that here in a moment. Um, it's about understanding biases. We all have them. They are ingrained in us. This is not about fixing ourselves as a person. This is about building awareness of self. The more aware we can be, the less afraid we are. Um, and it's also about being curious about the perspective of others. Once we start to do that work with the self, we can start to do that work as a team. Once we do that as a team, we can go bigger and bigger, bigger. But obviously the hardest one to move through to is culture because changing the culture of an entire organization is not a simple thing, but it has to start from within. 
So we're going to jump into frame 11. Um, obviously, doing this work has led me to a lot of interesting stuff in the neuroscience space. There is a ton of really interesting stuff out there about how these things impact us uh, in our brain when we experience them. So are any folks here familiar with amygdala hijack? Have you heard of it before? The lizard brain. So it's the part of our brain that's actually the oldest. Um, it is the one that kept us alive when we were cave people and we had to run away from mountain lions and dinosaurs and all sorts of things. Um, it When it takes over, it is really, it's our brain saying like, I'm trying to protect you and keep you alive. When that's happening, our frontal lobe, which is the logical part of our brain, isn't able to function as much, okay? So let's say when I witnessed that phone being thrown against the wall from my boss, I wasn't able to think clearly in that moment. It was absolutely amygdala hijack. I was just exactly right, George. It shuts down logical thinking. You're not able to think in a logical way and you're probably not gonna respond in a logical way. Um, our brains can also have a tough time knowing what is a real threat and what is being stressed or overloaded. So this is really asking us to slow down. And that's a lot of what the work is around psychological safety. And I think those of us who work in tech, it feels backwards because we're so used to moving fast. It's like, well, I don't have time to go slow. I don't have time to stop and think about things. I have to keep moving, have to keep moving, have to keep moving. It's about practice, like everything else. You're not going to be good at it the first time around, but the more you practice with intent, slowing down, building awareness, you're going to get better and better at it. And like anything with agility, practice, you know, writing code, all of that stuff, you're going to continue to learn things the rest of your life about it. Like I make dumb mistakes behaviorally every single day and they always teach me things, but it's really about building awareness. So let's move into frame 12, a little activity. So I'm gonna give you some scenarios about what happens in a certain situation and what comes up for you. So when I ask what comes up, I'm saying, what do you feel physically? If you were to put yourself in this scenario, what do you feel mentally? And what is like a reaction that you would want to have? So let's jump to frame 13. A leader who has a reputation for micromanaging starts coming at you via email, insisting on constant updates. Grab a post-it and just write down the first thing that comes to mind. What's the first thing that comes up for you? There are no wrong answers here, by the way. Anger, not replying. Irritation, frustration. Run away. Yep. Annoyance. I'm so shocked that nobody is like loving this. <laughs> it was amazing. It's like, oh yes, please message me every five minutes to see if I've done this yet. Frustration and fear, fear. Yeah. Anger, annoyance. I'm already too busy. Right. Tell them to chat face to face. I like that. Irritation, inability to focus on the job. Anyone want to blurt anything that came to them that they maybe didn't jot down? And if you don't, that's- Large cool exhale. Just- oh, <sighs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's like a physical response that you're having. It's like, okay, what is your problem? Yeah. I, I go numb to, to ignore him. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was trying to think of an example of this happening. And then I thought like, oh, I get angry. And then I almost get sad. Like, yeah. why, you know, that sort of like, why don't you trust me? Or, you know, all those things that come up about like, why am I actually angry about this? It's not right. Right. But that's like, I think a therapist told me that a long time ago that Oftentimes when we get anger, sad is just right there underneath because we feel shame. We feel freaked out. We feel hurt. We feel not trusted. We feel all of this stuff, right? All right, let's jump to the next scenario, frame 14. You share a new idea with your team and their responses seem dismissive 
and uninterested. What comes up for you here? Enjoy waiting. Frustration, bummed, yeah. Bummed out, frustrated. Surprised. Oh, cog in the machine, yeah. Group think. Ah, is anyone familiar with groupthink? A few folks. So groupthink is the idea that um, even if somebody disagrees with something, everybody else goes with whatever the majority is. It's, um, if anyone's seen the Challenger disaster documentary, which is amazing, but super traumatizing. Like within the first five minutes, I was like, I don't know if I can watch this. This is really hard. Um, that's what happened uh, with the challenger. Uh, there was a group full of executives who kept saying, it's too expensive, it's too expensive, we have to push it. But there were part of those executives who were saying, oh my God, this is such a bad idea, but I feel like I can't disagree because the whole group is saying we have to do this, even though the temperature is too low, even though all of these other reasons and they sent it anyway. So group think is powerful. Yeah, surprise, frustrated, do I even matter? This is demotivating. Let's jump to frame 15. Why did I have us walk through that? So I think that George earlier had mentioned um, trauma response, fight or flight. So we're talking about, I mentioned our nervous system earlier and how we respond when we aren't feeling psychologically safe. Um, there are many different versions of four or five Fs. These are the five that I relate to the most and have watched um, really unfold in professional environments more. Um, we've got fight. So fight is obviously you want to be aggressive with someone. Some people said frustrated. I might want to yell. We've got flight. You ignore it. You run away. Freeze is what I felt when my boss threw the phone. I didn't know what to think. I just kind of sat there stunned and couldn't process it. Um, there's this incredible book called the body keeps the score that I have listed in my recommended reading at the end of this that talks about a couple who was in this horrible car crash um, and one of the, the spouses got out and like was helping other people. And the other one just completely froze, could not move, couldn't think, couldn't do anything. And she was in that state for months until she started actually really undoing what was happening. And these can happen on micro levels. They're not always in these massive moments of a car crash or the challenger explosion that can be a small thing. Um, fawn. So fawn is an interesting one and one that I wish I did less. Uh, fawn is basically um, catering to someone's needs, not to fix the problem, but just to make them happier and make them calm down. So like when my boss threw the phone against the wall, I did not have the fawn response where I would go up to him and be like, hey, are you okay? What's wrong? How do I make you feel better? Blah, blah, blah. But it's one that folks tend to lean towards a lot in corporate jobs, because if you have a boss who's angry, if you have you know, um, a lead engineer, if you have even a product manager, whatever that might be, who you have to interact with all the time, and they're angry or they're bossy or they're a jerk or whatever, you might decide, you know what, it's just easier for me if I just placate to their problems and their needs and make them kind of go away temporarily. Unfortunately, the root of that issue still exists. The last one is how Cody described kind of the ugh, that feeling of like flop when you get that email and maybe you've been getting those emails for weeks and you are so sick of this person. I see this happen a lot when it's something that recurs consistently. So if somebody continues to do the same thing over and over, you're super frustrated. And it's just like, can you not do this? <laughs> um, so those are the five trauma responses. And if you ask yourself, you know, do you find yourself bouncing around in those? Most people experience more than one. They also experience different ones in different situations. Um, but just give yourself a moment to just kind of think about what's the one that I go to the most. And while you're reflecting on that, let's jump to frame 16. 
So we talked about trauma responses. Is anyone here familiar with Gottman's Four Horsemen or have heard of it before? Uh, so the Gottmans are a couple uh, who do are who do couples therapy, um, and they actually have a ton of really interesting data on how they can predict whether a couple will stay married or not based upon behavior. And part of this is for Horstman. So while we have those trauma responses, if we let our amygdala take over, we're going to react in a certain way. So let's say we're not thinking logically, or maybe we think logically for a minute, and then we're like, nah, screw it. I'm just going to do whatever I want. These are the four horsemen. So the first one is criticism. So criticizing is different than offering a critique or voicing a complaint. Criticizing is about specific issues um, where it's an attack. You're not just, you know, trying to give someone feedback. You're just kind of being mean. Contempt goes beyond criticism. Um, so this is like treating other people with disrespect. You mock them. You, you know, Maybe you get an email from someone who you think is super annoying, and so you're instantly going to go there. And as much as we would all like to think that we're saints, unfortunately, we're not. And we all feel these feelings. It is also not the worst thing in the world. We are humans, and we are going to experience these things. And I guess I'd like to call that out across the board. None of this stuff is, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. This is about awareness. This is about, oh, wow, I'm feeling a lot of contempt for this person right now. Uh, defensiveness is a big one, of course. So let's say, you know, you're feeling fight response. You might feel super defensive. You're going to want to defend whatever it is that you feel like someone's attacking and then stonewalling. Um, I feel like I see stonewalling a lot in Minnesota. I don't know if that's a local thing, <laughs> but a lot of um, just shutting down, not responding, not wanting to deal with things, passive aggress aggressive, aggressive. <laughs> Larry lives down the street from the Gottmans, like the real ones. That's amazing. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. That's so cool. <laughs> um, so let's jump into frame 17. Um, you're going to see these little, what look like little comic book sounds um, down on the bottom, because I'm also a comic book nerd. So if anybody has good recommendations, pop it in the chat. I always like to read new things. Um, someone accuses you of doing or saying something that's completely untrue, grab one of these little blobs and tack it on which one you would feel. Somebody says something that's totally not true. Contempt, defensiveness, yeah. Lots of defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Stonewalling. Yeah. Lots of defensiveness. Defensiveness is like the winner. You should also know that every time I do these, it always looks different because we all have different experiences. Let's jump to frame 18. There's someone you work closely with who is a rambler and constantly take meetings off topic and run over time. What do you feel? Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling. Criticism, contempt, stonewalling. Yep. Lots of criticism. So quick quick question. Yeah. What you feel inside and what you show are not necessarily the same. This is true. So to me, to me stonewalling is something you show potentially while you're feeling contempt mm -hmm. <laughs> or, 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 you know, or, or defensive or, or, yeah. So anyways. Yeah, no, that's a super valid point. Like sometimes it is something that's happening internally. And when that's happening internally, it's going to come out in some way, even though, even if we think we're being the sneakiest to Pete's and we're going to be like, you know what, I'm still going to show up to this meeting and not act like a jerk. People are intuitive humans and they will pick up if something is going on. So if you are stonewalling, there might be an observation of contempt, or maybe if you're feeling full of contempt, maybe you end up stonewalling, but that's a super great point. George, much like the five F's, you can feel more than one of these at once. And you might only be showing one outward, or maybe you're not showing any outward yet. 
but these things compile in our nervous systems. That's why I love that book, The Body Keeps the Score, because it really talks about our bodies don't forget what is happening to us, what has happened to us. We take those stories along with us and what we can do instead of ignoring them or trying to pretend they don't exist is just having awareness and being gentle with ourselves. I mean, like, hey, life is not easy. You are going to feel these things. Also, your feelings are valid. I'm just reading what's in chat for a minute. Interesting, I quit my job. And I, oh, wow. Negative feedback, constructive criticism. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you, Reggie, and good for you because people do not deserve that. They don't. And they need to find a better way. People need to find a better way to um, express themselves. And I'm sorry that you had to experience that. That's not fun for anybody. So we talked a bit about what these four horsemen are. Let's jump into frame 19. So what do we do about it? We feel criticism. We feel contempt. We feel defensiveness. We feel stonewalling. With criticism, we can do a gentle startup. This is all about slowing down. Slowing down enough so we can process what is happening in our brains, letting our frontal lobe chill out for a minute and be like, okay, how can I show up as myself because when I'm when I'm showing up and I'm really frustrated that's not me I am not my behavior so I want to show up as myself me doing me means I have to show up with my the best self that I can in the moment by the way this does not mean that you're never going to screw up again again this comes back to practice with contempt you can build a culture of appreciation reminding yourself of your partner's positive qualities um, again, they're therapists, which is why it says this, <laughs> um, and find gratitude for positive actions. So nothing is as bleak as we usually imagine that it is. If there's one thing that's annoying the crap out of us about another person, I encourage you to try and think about some good things about them. Um, there's this awesome um, interview done with Pema Chodron. I don't know if anyone's familiar with her work, but she's a Buddhist monk. She's super awesome. And I actually have a link at the end of my slides in the continued reading um, where Oprah's interviewing her. And she talks about how when we feel those moments where we're just so irritated and so driven crazy by someone to look at, look at that person and just think, that's me. Because whatever it is that you are irritated about, I guarantee you somebody's probably been annoyed with you about that thing. And they're human. They're human beings. Also, she's a Buddhist monk. So of course, she's amazing and brings all sorts of stuff to the table defensiveness, you can take responsibility. We do a lot of stuff in the psychological safety workshop around building responsibility for ourselves and the responsibility process. If anyone's familiar with that, um, it's way too much to go into here, but I will tell you um, it's a big part of our offering around how do we focus on being responsible for our behavior whilst continuing to practice awareness. Um, and then stonewalling is physiological self-soothing, taking a break. If you have the Calm app, if you have um, a way that you like to meditate or even going for a five minute walk, listening to music, whatever you need to do. Usually when we're stonewalling, treat yourself. Absolutely treat yourself. If you're stonewalling, you're spent. Some, you have hit, it's literally you're hitting a wall. It's like when a runner cannot physically run anymore, you've hit that wall. So what can you do? Give yourself a break. Even if for five minutes, try to find a way to communicate in that situation if you can. I just need five minutes so I can kind of come back. And actually I had someone in, um, my, in our public psychological safety workshop tell me last week that she and her partner have gone through in therapy, have gone through Gottman's process and they do that. So when things get really intense, she'll say, I, and she's a very intense person and she knows this. And she's like, I need to take 20 minutes. I'm going to go walk the dogs. I'm going to go do a thing and process things so that when I come back, I'm not going to be in this, um, in terms of like neurological, um, nervous system speak, this, a state of arousal is this heightened arousal where your, uh, your amygdala is like freaking out and you're just up here and you just want to like scream and you don't feel good ever about doing that. You're just kind of enraged. Um, it gives you a minute or, or you're just spent, you're shut down, you're stonewalling, give yourself some time to kind of process what's going on. Make sense? 
Any questions? What happens if the other party doesn't allow you to take the time to do that? How should you respond in that situation? If they don't allow you to take the break? Yeah, so if you feel stonewalled and you ask, hey, I need 20 minutes to walk away mm -hmm. and uh, they consider that you quitting on them in the conversation. That's a good question. I would, I guess, err on the side of you do have free will and you always have a choice. Um, that's a really good question, Matt. I think that if, if that sort of situation is happening, I would ask yourself, is this person respecting me in this moment? If they aren't echoing that and saying, hey, I don't feel respected right now. I'm, I'm asking you for some time because I'm not gonna be able to bring my best self to you right now. So this isn't a negotiation. This is me saying, this is what I need. And also, Matt um, actually is reminding me of this person who's gone through therapy with her partner. They will earmark it and say, like, put a time limit on it. Like, I just need a break. I'm not going to not come back to this conversation. I will come back, but it's going to be in 20 minutes. And I need you to respect that. And if you don't, then this really isn't a conversation. You're basically like holding me hostage because you need to be able to process with me. But that's not, that's not helpful. It's actually hurtful to me. So the more that you can verbalize what you're feeling, the better. And that is not easy. And I recognize that. Great question. Other folks. So let's jump into frame 20. So we talk about all of these things that we can feel. I mentioned like getting to know your triggers is knowing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and it's really important to know those things, but it's also really important to know the good stuff too, because that's where the magic happens. We are all incredible human beings who are capable of so much good stuff. So what you're seeing in frame 20 is something that I created a few years ago called, I call it team dynamics mapping. So I have worked with teams where um, I want them to get to know themselves better. So starting with that self and kind of doing some team building work. And this is an actual person that I worked with a few years ago. Um, and I like to call out a few things. So what inspires and empowers them, how I prefer to communicate, including Zoom preferences, because a lot of us work remotely now, what shuts me down and things I'd like to do better. The initial purpose of this exercise is to get to know yourself and get to know what are things that like I don't work well with. So in this instance, this person shuts down and usually I'll say, with what shuts you down, be as specific as possible. Like, is there a behavior that someone exhibits that drives you crazy, that you find distracting? So this person wrote anger, passionate conversations are okay, but yelling freaks me out. Um, you know that people in tech are always like, oh, I'm just being passionate right now. I'm like, are you, or are you just yelling? <laughs> because I think that it's a fine line, um, but it's it's really a great way to have self-reflection. So after doing a practice like this and things I'd like to do better, this is also great for leaders because they can see with their people like, oh, this is a way that they want to grow. So I really encourage leaders to practice things like this with their teams or have coaches or whoever's working with the team do this because it's going to give them really valuable insight into what these people's goals are. What do they want to do? Because how many times have you sat down with a manager and it's like, and they say like, so what do you, what's your goal? What do you want to do? That is like way too big of a blank slate. When you're in those moments where you're really processing thought, and I've worked with many, many engineering folks in my life who are introverted and really need time to process, give folks a minute. Like, don't just expect them to come up with these amazing ideas. Um, it's going to take some time to percolate. Um, and then if you jump to frame 21, once I have teams do this, this is the team that Jen was on, Mission Impossible. The teams share their individual stuff and then they put together, this is like the beginning of a working agreement. If folks have had working agreements on teams, this is a great way to decide as a team, like what are things that we value? Core working hours, this seems like core working hours. Stop working at 10 o'clock at night. There is no reason for it. It's not okay. Um, what their goals are. So what are their goals of the things that they're working on, things they want to improve and things they do not tolerate. Um, 
I've really found this is such a helpful way for teams to discover what their culture is and then come up with working agreements from this. It's like, cool, now you came up with all the stuff. What do you want to put in your working agreement? Are some of these things, you know, stuff that you do already that probably doesn't need to be included in your working agreement, but it's really good to have this because if you have someone new come to the team, they can take a look at this and create their own. And the team doesn't say, these are our rules, follow them. The team says, this is what exists right now. What's your input? Let's redo it. So much like a working agreement, it's something that should be updated early and often. And the tool I used here is Miro, Miro, Mural. Those words, <laughs> somebody hit rebrand. Um, but <laughs> um, this is, I use Miro, but you could use literally anything to create something like this. Um, other things that uh, you can do with your team. So frame 22, um, keeping the pulse. I know somebody had asked the question in chat, like how do you actually like get to know where what folks are feeling near y'all? I like that. Um, so I talked a little bit about how I am a fearless organization practitioner. When I go into organizations and work with teams, leaders, executives, um, this is what I measure. These are the four domains. It's inclusion and diversity, willingness to help, attitude to risk and failure and open conversation. Um, there's just four categories. There are seven questions. It takes about three minutes for people to fill it out. I do a pre-brief with a leader who is going to be a part of this conversation and kind of have a reality check with them and empathetically and say, hey, if you come into this conversation with curiosity, um, you're going to get a lot more out of it because otherwise your people aren't going to want to show up. And they're not going to want to speak to what's going on. And that's where all the value is. Um, and some teams choose not to have their leaders come. I have seen that usually not go great because then the leader really doesn't have insight into what's going on. Um, and I will tell you that most of them, most leaders that I've worked with who have gone through this, there's a reason they're wanting to do it. And the reason they want to do it is because they want to help. And they may not always be showing that in the best way, but this is a great opportunity for them to do that. Um, I meet with uh, everyone individually for 15 minutes just to do an introduction. So I'm not some rando showing up saying like, tell me all your feelings. Um, and then we do a two hour debrief with the team um, and come up with a roadmap, just like we would with a product to say, what do we prioritize? What do we wanna change? And it's not additional work. We're doing this all together. And then coming back and measuring in three to six months. Frame 23, uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit of what the data looks like when I get it back. Um, this is all confidential. I will never tell a leader, this person on this team had a score of zero on willingness to help. It's all private. Even if they ask me, it's a breach of data. I can't do it. Um, <clears throat> but you see at the bottom, uh, a bar with a line through it, the bigger one. So that is the median PSI of the group. PSI is psychological safety index. So the orange bar is the range that came through and the dotted line is the average. So this group is at a median score of 79. And everyone's first question is, is that good or is it bad? There really is no good or bad. It is where you are in this moment. So let's talk about where that is. And then on the upper right, you'll see willingness to help in teaming. This team actually scored fairly low. Uh, 76 is considered kind of an average. And this team is probably at about 64. Um, with willingness to help. My job is to go in and ask powerful questions to ensure that people can have a conversation about what's really going on. And we do all of that stuff, starting with a working agreement. So we all know how we want to show up together. We are being as genuine as we can. We understand our expectations of one another. Um, the focus is less on numbers and more on conversation. And sometimes these conversations get awkward. Shocking, right? Um, and that's really when the good stuff happens. The good stuff happens when we can really get into conversations that um, maybe don't feel so great for the person talking. Maybe they don't feel great for the leader. I know there's folks here in this room who've been part of these. Um, it's it, it can be really intense. Let's jump to frame 24. Uh, continuing connections. So here's a few uh, ideas I like to toss out to folks. <clears throat> how to continue doing you and then allowing folks in your group to do you as well. Um, establishing team norms in a social contract or working agreement that is actually followed and updated. 
so many times I see them made and they live on a hard drive and you're never going to look at them again. And that's pointless because you're not going to do anything with it. Um, if you do the team dynamics mapping uh, and then do a working agreement, just make sure that they're like, I don't know, once a month, once, once every three months, you say like, are these still pertinent? Are they still valuable to us? Um, encouraging freedom to fail, like having failure parties. If anyone's ever heard of Etsy's three arm sweater award, which I think is brilliant. Every year they give um, an engineer um, this award for having the biggest screw up. And it's actually kind of like this prestigious thing. It's, it's taking glory in how you have failed. Um, and reminding yourself when you're in frustrating and sticky situations that that person is me too, just like ref I referenced the Pema Chodron thing. On the right, you're going to see suggested reading and listening. I've got several books listed here, and it looks like it deleted the rest of my body keeps the score. I will update that. Um, Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson, Radical Candor by Kim Scott, um, Driving Fear Out of the Workplace, which is a fantastic book, and then a podcast that I did with Melissa Perry that you can have access to where we dig into all sorts of good stuff around this sort of thing. Um, and staying connected. So here are a few ways you can stay connected with me. Um, my contact info that Tara Scott is a link to my industrial logic page. That's my email. You can also join our IL Slack community. And I've got a link there for that. In the second frame, psychological safety workshop, you keep hearing me talk about it. This is something that has grown into this amazing, magical thing that I just am so proud of the work that we've done with it. And it's exploded. Um, we do public and private workshops. Our next one starts January 23rd, which is a Monday. You can get 20% off uh, for attending this chat using that promo code. We do have a few seats left for the early bird pricing. So if you wanna get in on it, please do. Would love to have you in class. Um, and then the psychological safety road mapping, what I was talking about with the, doing the measuring of the teams and all the things, you can read more about it at that link. I feel like I talked fast at the end there. Frame 26, Q&A. Sorry, I went five minutes over. <laughs> That's okay. That is fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Q&A, if you've got questions, you can raise your hand. You can take yourself off mute. Uh, let's yep. self-organize. Yeah. yeah, Karen. So yeah, back to me trying to get a job without freaking myself out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to figure out how to determine ahead of time whether or not an organization is at least somewhat psychologically safe. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think asking really intentional questions of them about their culture, how do their teams collaborate? How do they show up together? What is, um, do they have expectations of one another in terms of behavior? Um, you can get a lot from asking questions like that about culture. And if there's a lot of freezing or I don't know, or they just do their own thing, you're gonna know, I would say trust your gut because you're gonna know if something feels like super sketchy, it's gonna be like, okay, why is this so hard for you to answer? Um, I would look for, and I would say things to look for are relaxed body language, if you're able to see them in person or on Zoom, um, kind of play, more playful energy, people who are um, not, I actually was interviewed once by someone who seemed super stressed out. And I was like, I do not want to work here. Why are you so stressed? Like, I think people can, um, it, it, it comes out in ways that they're not even aware of sometimes. So I would say just pick up on body cues and language and ask like if there are specific things that you're concerned about, I know we feel like we have to come into these conversations like interviews, like buttoned up and you know we have to like present our best selves, but I think you have every right to be honest about things that you've been through where, where you can say things like, you know, I, I really want to work for an organization that has um, a really healthy culture and, and a healthy culture to me is X, Y, Z. What does your culture look like? I think that those are fair, fair conversations to have. Yeah. Can I add on a little to that? Yeah, please. Is so um, something that's frequently forgotten is when you're interviewing, it's not only the company interviewing you, you are interviewing the company. Yeah. yeah. And, and it is very important. And 
I come from uh, the standpoint where I practice my interviewing. That's something that I have done over time. Uh, it was advice I got early on in my career and it saved me very well, or it's served me very well. And so being able to go in and experience the culture a lot of it you can get just by talking to people on the way to the room that you're being interviewed. Yeah. You know, talk to them, say, hey, what's going on? You know, looking around saying, hey, what are those folks doing yeah. over there? I, yeah, I love that. I, yeah. And I love Rick's suggestion, network with people who work there yeah. and be like, hey, uh, what do you think? Do you enjoy working there? Because um, I have actually... <laughs> had, uh, I reached out to someone about a job. I don't remember when this was years ago, but they were like, yeah, um, it's not what you think it is. Because when I came into this gig, I thought about, you know, I thought it would, this is how they present on social media. Like it's amazing. And it's not. Um, so I think that it's always good to network, Rick. That's an awesome suggestion. And thank you, Steve, for chiming in. Anyone chime in with advice. I am not a human being expert. This is all about us collaborating. Question, how might you respond to a person who has a receptive language disorder, who has become adverse to even words like communication and questions that are open-ended? That's a good question. Um, I guess my question would be how, if, if I'm working with a person like that, what is the best way for me to work with you? If these are certain ways that you can't work, let me know kind of clear, as clear as you can, what's helpful for you and what's harmful. And then I can kind of do my best to kind of work around that. Um, because words like communication can be, that can mean a lot of things, right? So I think just having awareness how do you persuade management of the potential value of addressing a PSI <laughs> and not conversely the potential costs, costs of not addressing it? Um, so oftentimes um, I'll speak for myself here and then I'm going to speak broader. So usually when I go into organizations where someone says, I really want you to work with my boss, but I don't think he, they're going to think that they need this yet. Um, <clears throat> I, I have had conversations with folks to to kind of get behind what, what it is that they have concerns about um, because there's always something and I can lead it back to um, how they communicate. Like if their biggest concern is like, well, we don't get stuff done in sprints on time or something like that. It's like, right, well, how do your people work together? What does that look like? How do they collaborate? Do they collaborate at all? Um, do they communicate? Well, how do they do that? So digging in with questions around that sort of thing. I also do come with um, information around what it looks like when you do have a team and with data of what it looks like when teams do do that. And even providing examples of organizations like Google who do have these practices in place. Doesn't mean Google's perfect, but it means that they have taken the time to actually do these things and have kind of reap the reward, rewards of doing that. Um, it's not always an easy conversation. And if someone's not ready, they're not ready. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it from inside your team. Are there incentives or rewards that you have found to help encourage safety at, in organizations or teams? Um, I've never been like a big like rewards person, but it's for me, it's more about I think active listening can give you a lot. And so if you are listening to teams and leaders uh, about what their real concerns are and what really fills them up, you can kind of experiment and deduce like what might be helpful. Um, there was a team that I worked with who they just, nobody ever talked and it was really hard. And yeah, I can be a chatterbox, but, um, and, and it was a team full of engineers. It was all engineers, but like, how do I, how do I get them to actually talk to each other? Um, I got them talking about what they enjoyed. So like one morning we just started talking about, I have three dogs, so you might hear barking on occasion. I can't believe that's actually the first you've heard. Five pound chihuahua, <laughs> no teeth. Um, <clears throat> I came into conversations and tried to have everybody kind of 
talk just to get their, their voices warmed up and get used to them hearing themselves or in, it can be in chat. Like I know that, um, or as she had mentioned, like, I don't love to chat on zoom calls. That's cool. Then we find a different way to do it. Um, and getting them talking about things that they like, they're like, Oh, I love, you know, um, like, what did you do this weekend? You just ask like a simple ice, ice breakery question that they might be like, Oh, this is dorky, but everybody does it and it's fine. And nobody dies. And at the end of it, you might discover like, oh, these people are all gamers and they don't even know that like the other folks are gamers. So maybe it's giving them time of like, hey, let's do like an hour lunch if we want to, or like take a break where we all get to play. Um, and I can't remember what game it was that I ended up playing with them. Um, it was huge for a while. It was like the Among little, Us. What was that? Among Us. Among Us. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. And they loved it. And so it was like a thing that we would do. Like, once a week or whatever. I mean, nobody was micromanaging our time. So we had the freedom to kind of do that. But I would say looking for ways to connect people and bring them together to do things that they enjoy. And it's like a natural, it's like a natural win because then they're getting to do the thing they enjoy and they don't even realize that they're like building psychological safety amongst each other because they're hanging out and they're talking to each other like humans. And they're not doing, I have found like reward that doesn't work anymore is happy hours after work nobody wants to be on zoom anymore so just <laughs> go do something else because yep. people want to be with their families or friends or just not looking at a monitor for work mm -hmm. yeah. so I, I would like to add to that is and th this is for karen uh if you're interviewing at a place and it's in person and you're walking through the building and it is silent that is a sign to me Ooh. Um, because if people are collaborating, people are talking, people are having relationships, that means that it's okay for someone to stop and hang over someone's cube and chat with them. Yeah. Um, that's a and great that is, you know, coming in and seeing a community and a culture grow where people can actually stop and do that is one of the rewards that I've seen creating a safe space and building culture within a company. Right. Right. It's just, uh, I'll, I'll tag on to that because uh, when Steve and I worked together at, at, at a, a previous place um, and, and it was fabulous and it was very safe. And one of the complaints we often heard was your team is laughing too much. Oh, wow. Your, your team <laughs> is having too much fun. Could you guys not do that because it makes my team angry or, you know, whatever. Right. And, and, and it, so it's very much I totally agree with that. Um, one thing that I, when you were talking about getting people talking and that sort of thing, it really almost seems like they're not like, it, it's just getting to know your teammates. Mm -hmm. Like they're not really a team. They're just a bunch of people that work on the same, you know, right. feature and, and starting them in that process of making them a team by at least just getting them, you know, becoming familiar with the other people outside mm -hmm. of who the UI person is and who the back end person is. Right. That's kind of exactly it, Paige. Like getting people talking. And I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember who asked the question about how you can get leaders. Oh, I think it was Matt, maybe who asked about like how to get leaders to, to kind of listen to this stuff. Um, if you have like so many organizations have problems with like, we have product people and we have delivery people, or we have engineering and we have product or whatever you want to call it. We have bats and we have unicorns or whatever. And they don't know how to talk to each other. Well, a natural byproduct of starting to build relationships like this is you actually produce stuff faster because mm -hmm. you're not having to have like repeat meetings going on. If you did an analysis of how much time people spend in meetings trying to figure out what the heck is going on because the front end is not talking back end, whatever that might be. Um, if these people knew each other better, they would actually be able to produce not only faster because we all know that fast. So what if it's fast? Is it right? Is it, are we building the right thing? Um, we're having real conversations with each other. We know how to actually communicate with one another and can invest a little bit on the back end, for lack of a better term, to do that. I'm actually, I'd like to, you know, kind of extend and ask you a little bit about, uh, let's kind of extend on that to the us versus them attitude and getting to know each other, right? And because a lot of things we talk about are great examples of, like, a manager, like good example you had there of the manager coming in and trying to like ask micromanaging questions, right? 
Yeah. Well, there's an us versus them response in that, that we are recognizing. So the, if we have flip around, I'm actually being triggered by this, right? By this person coming and trying to pin me down and, you know, you know, drag me off of real work or, or, you know, hold me accountable for stuff that's irrelevant. But understand that likely what's going on is there's a stress response that they're having right now. Oh, yeah. And if yeah. you actually say, get away from the us versus them and realize what is freaking them out? Right. Um, why are they freaked out? And really just like, and you might not be able to in the moment get that information, but following up and finding out what's really like, um, who's coming after them? Why do they feel they're being come after? Like I actually talked to, a, like I watched in and a great example is I walked into a senior leader in, in place and, and just booked some time with them and, and asked them, you know, what worries you the most? Mm -hmm. And they said, like, literally, I'm signing up for all this stuff, and I have no idea if it's being delivered. So they were micromanaging the heck out of people. Yep. And because they were afraid senior leaders were holding them accountable for, for the budget, like they agreed to do all this stuff that the right. engineering recommended. And so they're on the hook. So once you realize that's going on, yeah. The way you provide visibility changes. If you can actually give them the visibility to show things are going well, all yeah. of that goes away. So understanding that. Totally. Absolutely. Love those points and actually jotted that down, Rick. That was awesome. Um, yeah. Us versus them mentality. Like, yeah, we're frustrated, but at the end of the day, like we can be frustrated with them all day. That's not going to make their stress go away. So how do we start to really understand what's going on with them? There's actually um, one of the weeks in our psychological safety workshop, we dig deeply into leadership dynamics. Like what does it mean to be a leader? Um, what, what sort of behavior does your leader kind of show to you? What does that tell you? How well do you know them? Like, what does that dynamic look like? Because it shouldn't just look like they get to come to talk to you. You don't get to go come talk to them. So I love that you like went and intentionally set up time and you were like, Hey, what worries you the most? That's awesome. I, I, I wish that, you know, people could feel less fear and be willing to just go have a conversation because a lot of times, I mean, one of my closest friends, um, was my director when I worked at this huge organization years, years ago. Um, he's a senior director. He has so much pressure put on him. And once I started to understand the pressure, I could say, okay, I know that these things are happening, but we tried this approach and you doing X, Y, Z, that didn't help. So can we talk about maybe doing that in a different way? It can open things up. Now, ultimately at the end of the day, I, I was like, I want to stay friends with you. And I can't keep working with a person who will always let stress trump everything. Um, and then your behavior goes off the rails and, and it's like, it's, it's not every man for person for themselves. It's you for yourself. That is, you know, a personal line that I had to draw, but I think really getting to the root cause of why a leader is behaving in a certain way is huge. So I love that. Um, hi, I'm Tony. We, hi, Tony. This has, been, this has been really great, Tara. It's really awesome. great. Um, I, we're all here seeking answers. And I just have something that came out last year that just, it's kind of fun to read through because you think, Oh, what would I do in that situation? I was there, and that's what this is. This is extremely therapeutic, this meeting we're having. But I'm just going to put a book up here. It's the Engineer's Survival Guide. Ooh. And not all the answers in here are ones that this meeting would support, and they might be wrong. But it's just a chance to see that everybody's going through this. It's okay yeah. to it's okay to take your own tact and, and survive. So... Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you for this great meeting, but I wanted to share that because it Absolutely. appears everybody here is searching for this kind of information. So That's I awesome. am putting that link in our Zoom chat to the mm -hmm. book, and great. I am going to absolutely check that out. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tony, and You're thank welcome. you for the feedback. You know, I wonder if there's a talk in this is why 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 isn't it okay to be empathetic in our daily lives, in our work? And some would say it is okay, but in some ways in tech, it feels like it gets pushed out. It's like, just work, just get it done. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can I add on to that? You know, um, so I am new to the world of tech. I'm, I'm in a coding boot camp right now. I come from sales and, you know, like um, marketing and that kind of stuff. So high, high uh, stress environments where, yeah. uh, you know, people are very much out for themselves and, and have a very much like shark like mentality. And it's all about the production and, you know, uh, results. And it's not about bonding and team building and talking about feelings. And so, you know, now that I'm attending some of these meetups and I'm talking with people in tech, um, the idea of psychological safe environments, you know, it's just not something I've ever heard about or talked about or experienced. So, you know, um, it's, it's just a, a revolutionary thing for me today. It's very, it's been very illuminating. And uh, I see some of that in the coding boot camp where like, you know, my cohorts, like uh, the students are bonding with each other. We, you know, we have a collaborative environment. Things are good. It's like, we are all supporting each other because we're going through this really intense experience at the same time. And it's just, it's such a cool thing. And I, I have never, ever experienced anything like it. So the idea that there might be a company out there that has this culture where um, you're, you're able to be yourself, you're able to do your best work, you're, you know, respected, and there's not the culture of fear that I've always experienced. Um, it just sounds like the best thing in the world. You know, that just sounds like the coolest thing um, to be able to work in an environment like that. So um, this has been very motivating for me. I've gotten a lot out of this. It's been actually one of the uh, best presentations I've ever <laughs> experienced. Oh, Most you. of them are not interactive. So this was just like really cool. It just um, oh, rocked my socks so today. So oh, I'm glad I rocked <laughs> your socks. Thank you, yes. Jennifer. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that um, I'm, I'm so glad that that resonates and it's absolutely possible. Obviously no organization is perfect. However, um, you know, that giant org that I ended up leaving, the teams I worked with were phenomenal. I mean, there was no, it, there was not, it was not about fear. That would, didn't mean we ever worked with another team that was like never problematic. That absolutely happened. But the shared experience of the teams that I worked with it was very clear that they were very intentional about wanting to show up as themselves and not have to put on a face and say like, I just, I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to be myself. I've, I've done that before and it's awful and it, it drowns you. And I, I love that it makes you feel good. And I, you know, I talked about my dad and sales and I've done sales and I know the high pressure that exists in there. And I'm super stoked that you're entering an industry that is, I think, starting to really evolve when it comes to this stuff. So thank you for that. George, I saw your hand has been up. Uh, thank you. Um, I just yeah. want to sort of throw out there that, um, the stuff I've been reading lately, and it's shown up on watching sports teams, they don't treat the people on the field as interchangeable. Mm -hmm. They try to leverage the things that they're excellent at. And, and so I, I sort of feel like the major problem in most organizations is this idea that, well, if I try to treat everyone special, it'll be a combinatorical nightmare of complexity. And it's just so much easier to try to make everybody look the same. And, you know, it, it, it's no wonder when you, I mean, the, the, a classic one is OKRs and KPIs. Yeah. It's like, oh, let's stress on the things that you are not good at, at the expense of the things you are good at. And to me, it's, it's just sort of like it's, it's this whole attempting to apply theory X, micromanagement, to, to, to people who are fundamentally there to think and to cooperate. Because while I think I'm a pretty darn good developer, I know I'm not as good as a whole team. And the team is just going to be better if they if they leverage the 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 excellence bumps in their personality as opposed to the opposed to the divots. Um, yes. Yeah, anyways. 
it's absolutely it's, it's very frustrating and oh by the way the other thing this this this, this book said was people don't leave companies mm -hmm. they leave teams yeah and they and they stay for teams so at least at the team level in theory the the com combinational complexity of dealing with the the you know the positive bumps isn't overwhelming in my opinion but you can't have someone who's doing uh, scrum uh, quote unquote by the book especially leaving out the part where it says this is where you start but not where you end um anyways that's my rant i appreciate that rant george thank you very much for sharing that and i i agree when we try and um mass produce people um and kind of that vonnegut book i was talking about is it's a lot about that it's like um you know let's let's try and make everybody the same all of these this research has been coming out lately around the reason why DEI efforts are exploding are not just because um, representation matters and it really, really matters. Diversity of thought, diversity of people are way more successful than when we have a group of people who are all the same producing something. We need different perspectives. We need, you know, it's not, a, um, you know, I've gotten into, um, there's a, a an awesome coaching program in Minneapolis, um, Sina Hodges, she's called the Woke Coach and she does all of this coaching around like, how do we start to add like DEI practices into our organizations intentionally um, and also producing data from that to show that if you, if you have more diverse people, diversity of thought, diversity of culture, background, all that stuff, look at the innovative things that you can produce. Like it's, there's so much awesome stuff that comes from it. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Thanks. Rick. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question around the, the freeze flight, uh, fight response and that sort of stuff. So I've, uh, I've been told and I read somewhere that it's a pattern like that you go through a cycle. You go mm -hmm. so basically, and, and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because I'm not that familiar with it, but as it was described to me, it's like you really, your brain, when you get triggered by something, it goes through. And the first thing is freeze, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's flight and you look for like to escape. And if you can't escape, then you look at fight. And if you get through those cycle, if you get through that pattern quickly, then you can actually deal with the situation. And I, I wasn't, you know, in that case, talk about the fawn and those responses. But um, so it, it's actually, I found it helpful. I don't know how true it is to recognize that that's a cycle you go through when you're triggered. And if you, mm -hmm. and you get, and in certain situations, you get stuck in one and right. recognizing what gets you stuck and knowing that you're going to move through it, but that the other one might come up. And so just getting through that entire cycle and then dealing with the issue is really the getting good at getting through the cycle. Yeah. What it is. Um, yeah, and it's kind of understanding your pattern. So I don't think from the reading, at least that I've done, um, and I wish I had a PhD in psychology, but I don't yet, maybe someday. Um, <clears throat> there are cycles that you will go through, but they're, they're not always, they're definitely not linear and they're not always the same. So everybody will go through different things. Like some people are not naturally angry people. Um, some people tend to go through anger, uh, you know, first, like it kind of depends, but eventually you do kind of exhaust yourself. So um, an example that I have, I can't remember where I even first heard this, but when you watch, like if you watch a nature program and there's a field full of gazelles and there are, there's a cheetah and the cheetah goes after the gazelle, the gazelle first runs, but right before the cheetah strikes, you watch that gazelle drop. Like, I remember watching this as a kid and I was like, why did the gazelle just like give up? The gazelle just like dropped to the ground. It was like, I tried, I tried, I tried, it flopped because your whole system, like your nervous system just shuts down. Um, and then there might be something going on in the background, like where hyenas are starting to watch what the, the cheetahs are no longer paying attention to. And the second that the uh, gazelle is watching the cheetah like not pay attention anymore, they get up and bolt and run away again. Mm -hmm. It's like, they're almost like they're, they're letting their nervous system kind of like bring them through that flow. But there's definitely a flow to the way that we go through those trauma responses. And I would encourage folks to, yeah, kind of pay attention to what your process is, because it might look something like um, maybe you go first into freeze, 
and then you want to like run away or maybe you go first into freeze and you're real confrontational so then you want to go into fight but what does it look like as you move through those cycles and how do you know when you're clear or you are clearer than you were so that's a great point thank you for bringing that up you know that highlights something that there's a lot to self-awareness and knowing how you deal with stress and everyone hum, humans are complex as, as Tara is showing you know talking about and and we all know they're they're complex animals and sometimes we fit into similar patterns sometimes it might be buckets of different patterns and the the key there is really knowing what pattern you fall into mm -hmm. and then being able to react to that pattern, yeah. uh, short circuit it, or push yourself through those hurdles till you get to a point where you can rationally think. I don't, wouldn't say rationally think, but when the lizard brain releases control and your higher brain can come in and think. Yeah, very true. Or the elephant in the rider, what we were talking about real early on. Thank you for that, Steve. Has the popcorn stopped popping? One thing I will share, because um, I realize I didn't have it. I don't think I have it in my slides, but I am on LinkedIn and I, I'm, I'm a writer, so I write a lot. And you can also follow me there because um, it's always fun to engage with folks and learn new things and do all of that stuff. So I do blog a lot, I write a lot. Um, and mostly that's from the work that I get to do. And I'm just grateful that I get to do it. And that, you know, people want to improve. We all want better worlds for ourselves. It's just about how do we, how do we start to do that and be able to like practice the crafts that we love without having to be worried about stuff that doesn't really matter. And that is, um, it can be, it can be different. It can be another way. I know that I appreciate the heck out of working with Tara and having the opportunity to do that. And Tara, you coming and talking to us. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I see Adrian does have a question. Oh, Thank you. Very one more. Um, how do you deal with the ongoing pressure of the work environment if the stress levels are too high? Oh. Also, is groupthink ever necessary in the work environment? Um, I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, I think groupthink is, um, it's a pattern to watch for. So I think that if groupthink, I think is different than collaboratively agreeing. I think the groupthink is more so we're all agreeing because we're all agreeing. We're not all agreeing because it's necessarily right. It's because I don't want to be different and I don't want to be wrong. So I would say groupthink, not so much. Uh, collaboratively agreeing. Absolutely. That's great. I mean, we're all on the same page. I think it's also good to disagree so you can come up with new and different ideas. Um, but I think group dip think is different from that. Um, how do you deal with the ongoing uh, pressure of a work environment? If the stress levels are too high, take a break for yourself, please. Um, it's so important that we do that without shame, without guilt. It is so much easier said than done. I'm saying this as someone who, um, you know, like I'm, I've been teaching at one point I was, I've been teaching three consecutive classes a week. So it's just like back to back to back to back. Um, and it's like, how do I, <laughs> how do I take a breather? Because I actually, I love what I do, but I'm, I also know that I can't bring my best self if I'm exhausted. And so if you're feeling like things are really, if the stress levels are too high, take a break and also assess if that environment has any intention of changing. And if you can be a part of that conversation. Um, stress will always be a part of life. Um, it's all about the way that we handle it, the way that we manage it. Um, and to not beat ourselves up when our brain just explodes and we're like, I legit can't do anything else with this. Um, George, George. How, do, how does group think relate to supporting the majority decision? That's an interesting question. Um, I think when you support the majority, when with intention then great but if you're supporting the majority because you don't want to be different that is a deeper conversation you need to have with yourself so if you don't want to stand out as the only one if that's the fear then majority or not um 
you have to be going with what is um, the best intent for you. Um, there are also, it's also pick your battles, right? Like how many of us have ever been on a team where people disagreed about something and you had an idea and everyone went with someone else's idea and not yours. That sucks. Like it sucks to have that happen, but how important is that idea to you? And if that's happening, like you fight for it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now I think the popcorn stopped popping. Always those last couple of kernels, right? I love that metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> when you pour the popcorn out of the popper and one pops right in your face. Yeah, that's I, that happens. So anyway, um, thank you again, Tara. Um, Absolutely. Thank you all then, so much for this. This has been great. Um, yeah, I want to get back to Seattle. For those of you, who and there. when you come, you're you're going out for food and maybe more. We'll get you out bouldering too. Ooh, yes, I would totally <laughs> love that. That sounds yep. amazing. And top pot donuts, please. Top pot. Yep, mm -hmm. we will. Mm -hmm. Although, Best apple fritters in the world. We might have to do a couple others because you know top pot it is good, but it's not the best. Okay, show me around. I like O's more. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. yeah. Well, they're vegan. Um, next nice. month, we've got Ron Cortell talking about modern product, man product management for engineers. Uh, should be a very interesting talk. Um, Ron's a good friend of the channel uh, and comes most, most months. Uh, then Paige will also go in December. Next month, because it's Thanksgiving, it will not be the fourth Thursday of the month for some reason. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, Steve. Oh, One thing I did yeah. want to mention real quick before before we all pop off. So I yep. had a discount code for um, the the upcoming class, the twenty percent off. That's only good through the end of the week this week. So if you do want to get on, in on that, please do. I just wanted yep. to toss that out there. Awesome, and we can post that in the uh, Seattle Software Crafters uh, Slack channel as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so our November and December meetings, which we don't normally have, we're starting to think about having regularly, are the third Thursday of the month because Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, I think that's all I got for that. I appreciate everyone that came and talked about that. Uh, talked about things uh, and asked questions, helped to extend the conversation. It was wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. This was so awesome. And yeah, I was thrilled to be here. I really be appreciate it. Before everybody leaves, there's been a lot of great stuff in the chat and you can grab it and save it locally. Yep. So there's a, there's a button in Zoom that just says the dot, dot, dot that allows you to uh, save the chat um, because once it closes, it's gone. It's gone forever. Thank you for that reminder. Awesome. There we go. Thank you all so much, folks. This was so Thank great. You. Really appreciated the conversation. Reach out on LinkedIn or email or wherever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have Thank a you, fabulous Tara. weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Stop recording.